Well, good morning. We're going to be beginning a brand new series this morning, so we're glad that you're here and part of it as well. You know, as I was thinking uh, about uh, our lives and the way things are, each of us, each of us have a certain number of hours, of days, of minutes that really frame your life. If you wanted to kind of summarize your life, it will be boiled down to what takes place in that framework. Each second that you have is an opportunity, a moment in time that, think about it, once it's passed, it's passed forever. You can never go back. I guess that's why we like those movies that, you know, where you can go back in time. You know, you can kind of hit the rewind and kind of go back there and recapture those moments. But the, the truth is, when the moment's gone, it's gone forever. And so the questions we have to ask ourselves is how are you currently making the most out of these moments? How do you make the most out of these moments? And then secondly, how are you investing your time, your life? Because that's really what time is. Time is your life. Time is how we kind of measure. It's linear for us, but it's kind of the, the, the markers of kind of our beginning and our end and what took place there. And what I want us to understand this is that you realize that by investing uh, a consistent small amount of time in in a a specific area, you can make a difference both right here now and in eternity. And that's really what this series is all about. It's all about discovering how that by serving others, we can make an impact. Now, of course, it's Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all our mothers. And if you're not a mom, um, too bad. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So so I want to kind of start out. uh, We're going to kind of segue into a message that that is going to be a little bit about mothers, but but it's going to be really applicable to everybody. So don't just tune out. Don't just say, I'm not a mother. So it doesn't apply to me. It's going to apply to you, too. I want to kind of start off with a little personal introduction. And I want to introduce you to four women that are the most influential women in my life, in my personal life, okay? All of them have made a great impact in my life and in their life of their children. Okay, the first person I want to talk about is my mom, okay? Of course, I wouldn't be here without my mom. Same, same with all of us, right? The question, where would we be without our mom? Okay, unless you're, unless you're Gary, then, then you know, well, we, we, we get that. But um, my mom, she's a mother of four boys and um, remarkable lady. Um, very, has a lot of talents and skills. For many years, she uh, worked in management positions in, in retail. Um, is, is just great at, at sewing. I mean, she can make stuff, you know. Um, She's an artist, she paints, and, and just can do some remarkable thing. But, but to me, her greatest achievement is she's the greatest mom in the world. She, um, she gave me values, taught me things that, that this is what is right and wrong, these are what to value. Um, she, she gave me a great love for reading, and um, she, helped, um, she helped really teach me what it means to be a man. And so I'm forever grateful. The other woman I talk about is my wife, who's the mother of our three children, Andrew, Karen, and John. And, um, you know, she could have done a lot of different things. She graduated from college and and could have gone into to do so many different things. But she really felt that her primary calling in life was to be a stay-at-home mom and to rear her children. And so that's where she focused, and she was an incredible mom. In fact, I'll tell you, she was a lot better parent than, than me. I mean, she, she's very, very good at that. She uh, cared for her kids. She loved her kids, was a great example for, for them. And then I talked about my, my Aunt Mary. My Aunt Mary, um, a mother of two, and uh, for many years she worked as a director of student services at uh, Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, very talented, very, very um, strong woman, um, but she raised two, two incredible children, and um, she's always been in my life. When, when I was very small, she would babysit my brother and I, and uh, 
has always somehow maintained a connection with us. And really, she's kind of taught me the value of, of family, what it means to stay connected with family. And then the, thir- the fourth lady there will be my cousin Gina. And many of you might remember Gina. We prayed for her for a number of years, or a number of days, not years, but, but six years ago, um, she was diagnosed with colon cancer. And we began to pray for her. At the same time as her diagnosis, she also found out that she was pregnant. She already already had two kids, and she was pregnant with a third kid. And they wanted to begin an aggressive treatment of chemotherapy, which they said that that would mean that they would need to abort the child. And I remember the conversations and prayers that we, Gina and I had together. And Gina just really believed that, that God was in this, and she just told the doctors, no, you have to find a different way. And so they, they came up with, with a unique approach to the chemo that she had. And she just had just rock-solid faith. And I'm happy to report that she's now cancer-free. S- s- six years going. And, and right now we've got a, a little girl named Gianna Hope, who's six years old. That's, that's now her, her third child. And so she, she kind of really taught me about faith you know faith isn't just something you read about it's something you experience and so they've made an incredible impact on me in fact I would say out of all the people in my life um, probably my mom had the greatest impact on my life but these women certainly have when you think about parenting parenting is so much more isn't it than just uh, providing shelter and food and clothing and buying your kids stuff. I mean, that's part of parenting. And sadly, for some people, they kind of think that's what parenting is. But parenting is so, so much more than, than all of that. Parenting really is just an awesome opportunity to prepare a young person to become a successful adult. And what we pour into them and what we do for them really makes a difference in their life and in eternity. So I want to begin, if you have your copy of God's Word, we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 1, if you want to turn there, and we'll put the verses up there in a minute. And I want to give you an example here from Scripture of two women that were amazing examples and invested in a child that resulted in an eternal impact. They, they, they made an incredible, incredible impact. And so 2 Timothy chapter 1, and let's begin in verse 1 and 2. And here's what the scripture says. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Now the epistles of 1 and 2 Timothy were written by the Apostle Paul to a young minister by the name of Timothy. Uh, Paul kind of became Timothy's spiritual mentor. He was really just invested so deeply in, in his life. Now, as this is all taking place, there's another scene that's taking place as well. In AD 64, Rome was ruled by a maniacal emperor by the name of Nero. And Nero, you know, he had some serious mental issues as well. Well, at one point, Nero set fire to the city of Rome, and Rome began to burn. And to draw the attention away from himself, Nero blamed the Christians for this. And so that precipitated a great amount of persecution against the Christians. Well, who was the number one spokesman for the Christians at that time? The Apostle Paul. And so Apostle Paul gets arrested and thrown into prison at this time. While he's there... In prison, he writes this second epistle to young Timothy that he might give him some hope and strength. See, Paul had been greatly invested in the life and ministry of Timothy for a long time at this point. And while Paul was there in a a prison cell, and incidentally he was awaiting execution, Paul would never at this time be set free. He'd be taken out of this prison at some point and be decapitated. His head would be cut off. And Paul's waiting for this to happen. And while he's got all this going on, what's on his heart is this young pastor that Paul had kind of poured into his life 
and he continues to invest in this young man and his ministry even in these circumstances. Go down to verse 3 and 4. Paul says, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with a pure conscience that without ceasing I have made uh, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day greatly desiring to see thee being mindful of thy tears that I may be filled with joy Paul's been praying for him Paul's been faithful to pray for him it wasn't one of these kind of quick prayers God just kind of bless him generically Paul was is is passionate in his prayer for the, Timothy And he's been praying for him consistently. And now that he's in prison, he longs to see Timothy once again, desiring to see him. Paul also has kept up on what's happening in Timothy's life. And so he understands that Timothy has been going through some hardships. As a a minister of Christ, sometimes there are struggles, there are challenges. The ministry isn't all joyful. Sometimes it's really, really hard. And yet... What, what sustained Paul and what sustained Timothy through this is they remembered it's a divine call. It wasn't an occupation that they chose because they couldn't do anything else. It was a divine calling that God had placed on their life. And even though it was hard and difficult, they stayed the path. And Paul's praying for him, understanding this. Paul then begins to reflect on the two people who had a significant impact on Timothy's life. That is his grandmother and his mother. And we find this in the next verse, verse 5. And here's what he says. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Let me give you the backstory as we go into this verse. During Paul's first missionary journey that, that took place in Acts chapter 14, Paul goes through this region of Galatia. And while he is there, he comes in contact with two, two of these people, Timothy's grandmother and mother, uh, Lois and Eunice. And on that visit, Paul shares the gospel And both of these ladies come to become believers in Jesus Christ and are saved. Now, Timothy's mom, Eunice, was Jewish. But she was married to a man who was a Gentile, very likely a pagan individual. And it's believed that at that time that Paul came on his missionary journey, that he somehow uh, had passed away, that he was out of the picture at this point. And so these two ladies become believers in Jesus Christ And they began to expose Timothy to the truths of God's word. In fact, um, in chapter 3 and verse 15, uh, it goes on to say this about Timothy. And from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith that is in Christ Jesus. At some point, his grandmother and mother led Timothy to Christ, and Timothy became a believer. Now these two women are just basically for all purposes ordinary women. They're not part of the nobility. They're not super rich or famous in any way shape or form. They haven't uh, done anything really significant that that would be historically noteworthy. And in, in fact if the Bible had not given us their names and mentioned it we would never have known about them. I mean, we would assume that Timothy had a grandmother and a, and a mother, but we wouldn't know their name or anything about them. And so they were just kind of ordinary individuals. Well, later, on Paul's second missionary journey that takes place in Acts chapter 16, Paul is going back through the same region of Galatia. And as he comes through there, he begins to reacquaint himself with the people that he had known at the beginning. And he now gets to meet young Timothy. Now, Timothy is still, um, he's probably a late teenager, maybe early 20s, we don't don't really know. But I want you to note some insights that that Paul makes about Timothy and his his mother. Go back to verse 5, if you would. Notice this verse again. And and that he says here, 
when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and am persuaded that in thee also. So Timothy's grandmother and mother invested in him. Now I want you to notice what they invested. First of all, I want you to notice the, that they had unfeigned faith. Okay. The word unfeigned, that's, that's an unusual word for us. I mean, how many of you used that word last week in a conversation? Okay, Probably not. It's a great word, but it may be a little confusing. The New King James translates that word as genuine. The CSB calls it sincere. So what he's saying is that the faith that the grandmother and mother had was the real deal. It wasn't just a, a superficial faith. It wasn't just, well, I, I believe, but there was no substance to it. It was, it was real. Faith really is the, is the uh, believing God. They really believe God. They didn't just say, I believe God. You know, a lot of people here, they say, oh, I believe God, but then there's no real evidence for that. You know, you can be religious and say, I believe a lot of things, but it doesn't impact you. But then as Paul looks at it, he says, listen, this, this, this sincere faith, this genuine faith that was in your grandmother and mother, he says, I see it in you too, in you. In other words, his faith was real. His faith wasn't just something that, that he um, you know, claimed to have. It was something that they lived out. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we read in the Bible here, and we read from these things, and we say, oh, yeah, I believe it, but then we don't do anything with it. And so often there are Christians, and they're Christians on Sunday morning, and they come Sunday morning to church, and it's like, amen, and yeah, that's what the Bible says, then Monday comes, and we just kind of toss it aside, and we just live our lives as though Sunday never happened until we get to next Sunday, and then suddenly, you know, there's this transformation. Well, in their life, this was real. Timothy saw something in his grandmother and his mother that was genuine. It wasn't just superficial. It wasn't just veneer. It was the real deal. And Paul says, now, I'm seeing that same thing in Timothy. Okay? What an incredible thing to see, see him. And Timothy there. Parents, it's easy to tell our kids to, to do as I say, but don't do as I do, right? And we've done that. All of us have kind of done that to some, some degree. Your parents did that. And usually what happens? Well, the kids end up doing what you do, not what you say, right? When if you tell your kids to be honest and they witness you being dishonest, they figure, well, you can be dishonest in these circumstances. Or if there are certain things that are habits and you say, well, that's a bad habit. Don't, you know, don't do that. Don't, don't get drunk or don't, get, or don't smoke or don't use bad words. And yet parents do that. The kids end up growing doing those same things. Okay? You did it like with uh, the same things, and so your kids do that. So it's not enough just to simply say, well, this is the right thing or whatever. But you've got to do the right thing. And Timothy's life was impacted because his parents didn't just say, his mom and grandma didn't just say, live this way. They lived that way. They, they made it real. And at some point, Timothy said, that's what I want. And Timothy made that him. He embraced it for himself. He wasn't just trying to make mom and dad happy. It became a part of him. Later, it was said of Timothy, okay, in uh, Acts chapter 16, when Paul got there, here's what it said of him, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. So when Paul gets there, the, the believers there all spoke well of Timothy. He had a good reputation. And Paul began to hear things about Timothy, all, all the church people. Yeah, this young Timothy, Timothy, he's an outstanding young man. He loves the Lord. He's the, he's the real deal. And it caught the attention of Paul. And so what did Paul do? Paul invites Timothy, listen, I'm going to continue these missionary journey. Why don't you come along with me? You could be of some use. And so he invites Timothy to come along with him on the missionary journey. And he begins to train Timothy for the ministry. And so Timothy comes and, and follows him along with it to prepare. Now listen, mom, dads, 
grandparents, aunts, uncles, just ordinary church people, okay? We have an incredible opportunity to impact the lives of young people that are around us. Now, maybe you have them at home, or maybe you don't have them at home. Uh, certainly, we have them here. And there's opportunities to impact the lives of people and to make a difference. But you only can make an impact in their life, hear me, if you make an investment. If you don't make an investment, there's not going to be an impact. So let me just pause for just a second and talk to you about what that means. When I talk about an investment in someone's life, there are components to that investment. Okay? The first aspect of it is, has to do with time. You've got to invest time. You say, well, is that quality time or quantity time? And the answer is yes. Okay? I'm not sure kids know the difference. Yeah, you've got you to make it quality, but you also have to make it quantity. You can't just simply be, well, I've got five minutes right now. Hope you get this. You've got to spend some time. And if you're going to invest in the life of someone, you've got to take some time and invest it. And if you're going to take time to invest in someone, here's what it means. It means you have to give up something that you're doing so that you can spend time with them. That means you have to give up watching your TV show or, or you know, doing your hobby or washing your car or killing chinch bugs or, or whatever the fun things you like to do with your life or whatever. You've got you've to take, give up some time to do that. It requires, listen for it, selflessness. And that's hard because we are all, by nature, pretty selfish creatures. We want to do what we want to do. And if we're going to invest in someone, it's going to take time. Here's the second element it's going to take. It's going to cost you some money, some resources. You can't do it without an expenditure. Okay? There's a price to pay. You can't do it without spending it. In fact, Jesus made this statement. We're not going to turn there, but if you want to go there later. In Matthew 6, 21, Jesus said this. Jesus said that wherever your treasure is, that's where you'll find your heart. If you want to know where your heart is, open, open up your banking account, look at your check registry, whatever, and you'll see where your heart is. That's, I, that's not my jo- uh, words. That's not some a pastor saying. Jesus says, wherever we put our money, that's where our heart is. And so don't say that our heart is really with young people if, if it's all on me. Don't tell me, that your heart is here at Faith Baptist Church if you don't ever give an offering. Jesus says you're lying. Okay, We put our money into what's important. If it's important, we put our money into it. If it's not important, we don't. And that's just the truth of the matter is. So it's going to cost you time and money. Thirdly, it's going to cost you effort. You cannot be passive about an investment. You have to be able to work at it. And let me tell you, it's not easy. I mean, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it, but everybody's not doing it because it's not an easy thing. It's not one of those things that it's a one-and-done thing. You know, I I did it, you know, I came and I did this, and, and I'm glad that's over with. No, this is something that has to be ongoing because, again, you're developing. You're, the, the life is going on and on and on. And it has to be more than just talk. It, just, it has to be more than just simply words that we put forth. Words are good and important, but there has to be some action. If you really care for that per- young person, you're going to invest some time and money, and that means you're going to do something with them. You know, you're going you're gonna to have a meal with them. You're going to take them fishing. You're going you're gonna to attend a, a, a ball game or a concert or whatever they're into. You're going you know, to do something tangible. It's an effort that's involved. And then the fourth thing is heart. Heart. You have to care. You have to have genuine love to make the investment. It can't be done grudgingly. And some of you, that's how you do. I'm helping out so-and-so, but I wish I didn't have to do that. I hate that. You know how much time this is costing me? You know how much money this is costing me? I, I wish, you know, I wish they'd find somebody else, but they I am God bless me because I've just given and God just says eh, you just lost your reward 
You spent all your time and effort and money in this, and God says, you're not going to get anything out of it because now your heart's not in it. Heart. Love the person. And can I, can I be real blunt for some of you older people? Your goal in investing in young people is not to mold them into your image. That's what a lot of you think. If these young people would just be like me, well, then they'd be an old person, right? <laughs> right? There's a reason why they're not like you, because they are not you. They're a young person. Do you remember growing up, and this is probably true for most of us, our parents didn't like the music that we listened to. They didn't like the, the clothing styles that we wore. They, they didn't like the other things. I mean, that's, that's just normal. I mean, that's how things are. And, and you're looking at young people and go, well, why don't they dress like me? Because, you know, they're, they're 16, you know. They, 16-year-olds don't do that. Well, well why, why aren't they more responsible, whatever? Because they're a kid, you know. And, and we forget those things. And I'm not saying we shouldn't teach them values and responsibility and, and things of that nature. But here's the deal. If you really want to invest in someone to help them, they don't want to be your project. Okay? They don't want to be your project. They don't want to be the, this is my project right now. No, they don't, they're not interested. You don't want to be anybody's project, do you? No. And so, no neither do they. They just need to know that you care about them and you love them. That's what they need more than, than anything else, and we sometimes neglect that. When, when I was a young Christian, there was a couple in our church that really invested in me. In fact, I would spend hours up at their house. On Sunday after church, I'd go over there, and I'd, you know, I'd hang out till late, and I'd ask Bible questions, and they, they were kind and do it, and you know, eventually they just said, hey, you know, we're going to bed, uh, chain the door on the way out, you know, type, type thing. And they invested me. Now, I was thinking about it. I can't really tell you any profound advice they gave me. I can't say these are the words that they said. I don't even remember that. But what I do remember is they loved me unconditionally. I felt accepted. And, and what that did is that drew me closer to the Lord and helped me to grow in my faith. And so invest will cost you those things. It's going to cost you, my friends, some time that you invest in that person. It's going to cost you some money. It's going to cost you effort. It's going to cost you heart. So what happened to Timothy? After, after this great investment was put into his life, what was the outcome of that investment? Look down at verse 6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Here's what happened. Sometime later, as Timothy is on this missionary journey, Timothy receives a call from God to come into the ministry. And Timothy realizes, God is calling me to be a minister. And he surrenders to that call and Paul was talking about that he had the great joy of laying his hands on Timothy at the right point and being part of ordaining Timothy into the gospel ministry. I mean, Paul was like his spiritual father, and this was like, man, this was the high point for Paul to see a young man called into it. So what happened to Timothy? Well, Timothy later went on, and he became the pastor at the church of Ephesus. You might remember that there's a book that Paul wrote called the book of Ephesians. That's the church that Timothy pastored. Great church. In fact, later, Apostle John in the book of Revelation is going to mention the church of Ephesus as one of the seven churches that he mentions. So a very famous church that Timothy now is the leader preaching and leading that, that congregation there. And think of all the lives that Timothy impacted and how many souls came to Christ and how eternity was, was changed because of this young man and his surrender because of the impact and the investment that was made. As Paul was near his death, and Paul's getting ready, and he knows he's going to be executed, what does he do? I want to see Timothy. If I could, if I could see anybody else, I, I want to see this young man, and I want to give him some, some encouraging words. Timothy. 
What an impact his grandmother made and his mother made to him. His Christian friends. They were never famous. They were never celebrities. But here's the takeaway I want us all to get from this message here, and simply this. Your most important accomplishment may not be something that you do or achieve, but someone you lead. So we always think about, well, my great, what's your greatest accomplishment? And you kind of think, well, I made it to this level at work, or I built this, or I, you know, I you know, bowled a perfect score, or I you know, did this, or whatever it is. And we kind of think of something that we did, and yet your greatest accomplishment okay, may not be what you did, but the, someone that you invested in, someone that you led, and what they did for the kingdom of God. Maybe you're just an ordinary mom ordinary grandma, ordinary dad, ordinary grandfather, ordinary uncle, aunt, ordinary adult church member. What can you do? You can invest to make an impact. The question is, are you investing? You just fold your arms and just say, oh, I hope it turns out, or are you investing? You only have so much time. One of the big fallacies we tend to do is we tend to say we tend to do this. Here's what we do: one day, All right? One day. That's that's what a lot of you do. One day, Pastor. One day I'm going to do this, and one day I'm going to do that. And you know that one day a lot of times never comes. So the question is, what are you doing? Not what you're thinking or hope to do. What? tangible thing and it doesn't take a lot it doesn't mean you have to just give up everything and just you know i'm going to quit everything and i'm just going to do this no just a consistent small amount can make a huge huge difference moms thank you for the impact that you make in your kids parents don't give up it's hard but stay with it those of you that are church adults care do something you can so if we're going to make an investment here here's my challenge for us this week make an investment in a young person's life this week do something like i said it's going to cost you some time it's going to cost you some money it's going to cost you some effort it's going to cost you heart there's a price tag with it you can't invest for nothing I mean, you'd go to your stockbroker or financial planner and say, I'd like to make an investment. And they go, well, how much money would you like to put in there? Oh, I don't want to put any money in there. I just want to get some back. You know, imagine what he would think of you. Of course, you'd say, well, of course you've got to put something in. Well, if, if you've got to put something. Well, I've already put some stuff in, then put some more. Well, I've already put some more. Then just keep doing it until it hurts, okay? And then keep doing it because that's what Jesus did for you and that's what he did for me. Mom and dad, stick with it. Your kid doesn't need you to be their friend. They need you to be the parent. Amen. Just be the parent. And that's hard to do sometimes. Others, I, I want to encourage you, make a gesture. Do something. Don't preach at the young people. Okay, They, they don't need you to preach at them throw 15 Bible verses at them and, and, and show an interest. Show them that you care about them. Speak positive things into their lives. And you know what? They may listen to you at some point. Maybe. Stranger things have happened. But I promise you, until they believe that you truly love and care about them, you're just like Charlie Brown's teacher, you know, right? Wah, 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 wah. That's all they hear. But love can make the difference. You know, Jesus saw the value in you before you recognized it in yourself. He made the ultimate investment as he sacrificed his life on the cross for you and for me. He died for our sins. And though the world didn't give us any value, Jesus valued us with his life to give you a new life a different life, an abundant life, an eternal life. 
Timothy one day understood that. One day it just all clicked in his mind and, and heart, and Timothy said, that's what I want, and he embraced it. And when he did, his life was never the same. I didn't say his life had no problems and difficulties. Oh, he had lots of problems and difficulties, but his life was never the same. See, his grandmother and mother knew something that they passed on, and they understood that religion couldn't do it, and the good works couldn't do it, but Jesus could. And Paul would later write to them, to the Ephesians church, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, familiar passage, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God wants to give us the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. But will you accept it? Will you set aside your effort and your, your stuff and receive what Jesus has done for you? And by faith to receive his grace and believe that Jesus died and he rose again and he is alive today. If you'll repent of your sin and turn to Jesus, your life can begin a new journey, a new destination, a new hope. Let's pray together as I close. Father, once again, I want to thank you for the gracious love that you showed us, though not worthy of this thank you lord for your care and your concern for all that you have done for us and i lift up to you today each person that's here that you would help them to make that investment on someone this week i pray particularly for the moms grandparents the parents those that are involved with it that that you would bless them for the investment that they've made and lord as a as a parent we understand we're not perfect parents. There are many things we wish we could kind of go back and change and cannot. And so as we move forward, Lord, may we realize your grace is sufficient. Help us to make an impact on those in the days ahead. Forgive us. Empower us, Lord. And may you be lifted up in our lives such that others see that it's real. In Jesus' name I pray.